Today is Monday, April the 8th, and our speaker today is Dr. Phil Oliver, who is right behind me here next to Dean Bile. Dr. Oliver teaches uh, philosophy classes um, and many honors classes in this building, three this semester, as a matter of fact, and all upstairs, and some of you may be in one of those three classes and you may know him very well. Um, we wanted expressly to have a philosophy take on this semester's subject of mental health and well-being. We wanted very much for this to be a part of our series, so we're very glad that Dr. Oliver is with us today. He's an associate professor in the MTSU Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies. Dr. Oliver specializes in the American philosophical tradition with supporting interests in applied ethics, particularly bioethics and environmental ethics, Anglo-American literature, history, humanism, naturalism, science and exploration, peripatetic walking and talking philosophy, baseball, cycling, swimming, the pursuit of happiness, and the perpetual dawn of each new day. Um, he is the author of William James's Springs of Delight, The Return of Life, it's a VU Press volume, that urges our appreciation of the intensely personal character of spiritual transcendence concerned with the William Jamesian concept of pure experience. In it, he illuminates interdisciplinary ties among philosophy, literature, and many other intellectual domains. You can follow Dr. Oliver on his many social media platforms. He is on Threads and Mastodon, I've noted. He is not on X any longer. Instagram, he is at Ossifer. <laughs> he has a substack and a blog spot called Up at Dawn. Um, but of course, as Immanuel Kant and Monty Python's Brian agree, you don't have to follow anybody. Instead, you really need to think for yourself. But Dr. Oliver urges, do not think by yourself. Good philosophy collaborates and converses. And if you're lucky enough to receive one of Dr. Oliver's emails, his email signature is followed by some of his very favorite quotations. E.B. White asks, save or savor? Quote, I arise in the morning torn between a desire to improve or save the world and a desire to enjoy or savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. And from Walden or Life in the Woods by Henry David Thoreau, um, quote, the light which puts out our eyes is darkness to us. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. There is more day to dawn. The sun is but a morning star. And perhaps that's especially fitting and a good quote for today's um, Eclipse Day. And from the Latin, from Marcus Aurelius, um, he adds at the bottom of his emails, quote, when you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love, dwell on the beauty of life, watch the stars, and see yourself running with them, end quote. All of those ideas are important, they are important thoughts and contributions toward our personal happiness, wholeness, and well-being. One of Dr. Oliver's favorite courses that he teaches here at MTSU is the philosophy of happiness, and that's the topic on which he's speaking to us today, on healthy minds and flourishing lives, a philosophical approach to mental health and happiness. Dr. Phil Oliver. Hello, looking for familiar faces. I think there are a few out here. Good to see you. And my clicker, and we'll be off. That last, uh, that last Aurelius quote is actually my penultimate slide today, if I can get that far. And it is, it is something that I try to remember to say to myself every morning. All right, uh, you're lucky to be here. And the, and the thing about um, the, the Thoreau quote about putting putting your eyes out, that's especially relevant. It was especially relevant in just the last uh, hour or so, right? Um, if you looked in that direction, I hope you had glasses. I, I had glasses at home that I set aside so that I wouldn't forget them. And I forgot them. Fortunately, Dean Vile and, and, uh, and Dr. Evans and others were generous enough to share theirs, and I got to take a peek at the Crescent Sun. Very cool. Uh, so, yes, on Eclipse Day, thanks for being here when you could instead have gone not very far to see a total eclipse, an eclipse in its totality. Not everyone sees things the same way, of course. There's a click. <laughs> I do wonder how the flat earthers reconcile 
uh, their, their perception of the eclipse with their world. I don't think they do, rationally. I always make too many slides, today being no exception, but you can find this presentation in its totality. And, uh, and all my other presentations through the years, including I think a half a dozen or so here uh, in the Honors Lecture Series, at a site on the internet called slideshare.net, which is a very useful site where you can upload and download slideshows from all kinds of people. So go there if you need to. Thank you. You good, my mind? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Evans already talked about the lineup, and I just wanted to take note of the fact that I'm near the bottom of the lineup here, so uh, gosh, it's, uh, it's rushing out as quickly. The end is near, as the saying goes. Uh, the reason I put an image of uh, baseball lineups there is because I'm a baseball fanatic. I always think in terms of lineups. That's the way we keep uh, keep track of participation and pre and attendance in my classes is with a baseball score card. Some people like it. I, I do. So I'm delighted to return to this esteemed lecture series. I've been honored to participate many times in the past, most recently in 2022, when I was invited to speak about Aristotle and friendship. It turns out to be a topic that has a lot in common with with mental health and happiness and flourishing. Uh, in my Philosophy of Happiness course last fall, we talked about the crucial importance of friendships and relationships of all sorts in sustaining our happiness, our health, and then the physical, which on my view are but two aspects of the same thing. And overall well-being. We read this book called The Good Life, uh, Waldinger and Schultz, uh, Lessons from the World's Longest Scientific Study of Happiness, and, and that is the upshot of their, their long a longitudinal study where they followed a bunch of Harvard students throughout their lives and then, and then continued to follow the lives of their children and uh, came away with the conclusion that it is those who attended most uh, diligently to their relationships and their marriages and friendships and, and uh, all kinds of social relationships um, who were the happiest. So don't neglect. And, and you can't always do it best on so-called social media where I'm over invested myself. <laughs> Face-to-face uh, -face, uh, relationships and friendships are very important. Uh, so that's the first str strategic advice. If we're looking for, for strategies of flourishing. Um, that I would offer, do not neglect your relationships and particularly your, your friendships. Very few mentally healthy people do. Uh, a few of my friends at a, a ball game, a few years ago, after we had fallen out of touch, this is my old grad school cohort, who. Uh, this guy just retired from Western Carolina University. Uh, uh, this guy just retired from the University of Alabama Huntsville. And uh, um, the other guys are talking about it, and I guess I'm, I'll be talking about it soon. Not yet. Um, we made a point to reconnect a few years ago. We said, you know, we all live at, at, the, at the different points, uh, mostly throughout the, the southeast region. Let's just pick a spot and go there once a year. And, you know, just before the fall semester begins. So we've been doing that for a while, and most recently we went to Kodak, Tennessee, over there uh, to see the, uh, the Smokies play minor league baseball. So um, it's never too early to start that kind of a tradition, I would advise them. Consider it. You know, and once you graduate uh, uh, and lose, begin to lose touch with people you thought you would never lose touch with, well, don't. <laughs> Uh, so I always start all my classes the first day of the semester with two questions for people. Who are you and why are you here? So to answer my own question, I'm the guy who teaches courses here, as you've already heard, on philosophy of happiness, ethics, environmental ethics, bioethics, the environmental ethics course coming up again in the fall. Uh, I focus on American philosophy and specifically the philosophy of William James, older brother of the novelist Henry James, both of them the sons of Henry James Sr. and his good friend Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, I'm here today, I think, because Dr. Evans wisely recognizes philosophy's relevance to the quest to attain and sustain health in the flourishing state that Aristotle called the Uh There you see the cartoon image. Uh, you know, oh, there are all kinds of ethics, bioethics, medical ethics, legal ethics, environmental ethics, and then there's ethics ethics, and, and that's the big umbrella. Eudaimonia. This is a quote from one of the texts that we read in my Intro to Philosophy course, which I call co-philosophy because good philosophers collaborate, and we're all co-philosophers. Uh, Aristotle's eudaimonia is the view that if you think of a flower, you can water it, you can give it enough light, maybe feed it a little, and then it'll grow and bloom. Human beings can flourish like that, too. with the right conditions, with the right nurture, 
the right self nurture to a degree. And I can just drop this. <laughs> Aristotle says the uh, work of a human being, that's important to distinguish work from labor. Uh, Hannah Arendt made that distinction. We've been talking about that in class recently. Uh, labor is what you do because you have to, to earn a living. You may or may not like the work. Work is, is what you're supposed to do and what you should be gratified to do and what should enable you to flourish. Finding your work in life is a crucial ingredient to uh, well-being, to flourishing, to you, Daniel Mead. Uh, Aristotle says, if we posit the work of a human being as a certain life, that this is an activity of soul and actions accompanied by reason, the work of a serious person, who fix his sexism, is to do these things well and nobly. But in addition to complete life, for one swallow, this may be the most poetic thing Aristotle is reported to ever have said. <laughs> uh, we don't know. A lot of his work got, got uh, obliterated in the great uh, sacking of the Library of Alexandria. In Egypt. Um, and so a lot of what we have from Aristotle is secondhand in student lecture notes. So those don't tend to be poetic, as you know. But uh, one swallow does not make a spring, nor does one day. And in this way, one day or a short time does not make someone blessed and happy either. So if you're going through a phase of unhappiness, give yourself time and be patient and uh, realize that you've got time to work with and at least you can make sure. Followers of Aristotle, as uh, you've already heard this word, but maybe you didn't, didn't register, uh, they were known as peripatetics because they passed their days strolling and mind wrestling through the groves of academe. Really that article, the, should not be there. That would be confusing because Plato's school was called the Academy. Aristotle split away after many years at the Academy to found his school called the Lyceum. Right? The Romans also had a high opinion of walking as a sort of a trigger for thinking and reason and rationality and ultimately eudaimonia happened. Uh, and that, uh, that high opinion is pithily summarized in the Latin proverb, it is solved by walking. Salvatur ambulanda. Which originally was, uh, was expressed by the original cynic Diogenes, um, who was arguing with Zeno, who said that motion is unreal. He was trying to generate paradoxes of motion that said that motion, motion and change is an illusion that everything must be permanent <coughs> as it is and can't change. Diogenes, I think quite rightly, cynically, uh, but not in modern signification, walked away. He said literally, it is solved by walking, seeming move. <laughs> you know, um, a lot of uh, abstract argumentation in philosophy and in academia generally can be dismissed and dispatched in just that sort of a demonstration. Right? In real life, we know that some of the things we can say with words don't hold up. Uh, and this is from an essay called Gymnasiums of the Mind, which appeared in a popular philosophical journal. If time permits, we can go back to that. Because there are a lot of good uh, perspectives from various philosophers through the ages on that. Arabic life, but uh, we'll see in time for minutes. I hope you'll agree that philosophy and ethics are indeed relevant to today's society, especially in the age of AI. Right. And there's the question, how important are ethics in today's society? The point was that uh, not only is it possible for dishonorable people to cheat by looking over other people's shoulders, and these days it's possible to cheat by looking at a computer screen. And, prompting AI to answer your questions for you. Uh, I think it can be a useful tool, AI, but I think we're still figuring out how to make it mesh appropriately in ways that, uh, that don't subvert our attempts to be educated and to be reasonable and fat. Before I go any further, though, and before the eclipse is total history, if you ever get another chance to see a solar eclipse in totality, I recommend that you take it. Instead of staying a couple hours drive away in order to attend a lecture, you could have waited to see it. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times only yesterday, which I, I liked so much. It was apropos of the, uh, the eclipse and the thoughts that some people had about the eclipse, uh, that I had to squeeze it in. A mountain climbing enthusiast was quoted describing her experience of first glimpsing sunrise near the summit of Mount Everest. And she said she felt profoundly, quote, connected with something much larger than myself, something bigger than herself, something that she believed loved her. And that last twist is probably not a universal reaction that everybody on the mountain or gazing at an eclipse or whatever would have. But 
some people, many people, report something like that. She said the whole thing is very awful, but she didn't mean awful, she meant awe-inspiring. Uh, she said, what I am realizing is it was the process the whole time. It was never about the top of any of the mountains. It was about getting there. It was about being attentive to your own experience as it unfolds. Most awe-inspiring of all was simply being present to the moment. This is such an important aspect of eudaimonia. Be present to the moment, both to the world and to those around you. That's what she said. As they suffered together in the cold and cheered each other on, you know, there's, there's a strength in numbers and solidarity and in shared experience. That is where the magic is. She says, I'm not living in the past, I'm not living in the future, I'm just here. You know, that old, uh, uh, that old saying from uh, a popular version of Buddhism, be here now. That's, that's the idea. And that, of course, as most things do, reminds me of William James, the American philosopher. This feeling of presence in the moment, free of regret for things past or worry about things future, free of self-obsession, is what William James identified as the pinnacle of the experience, or he called it a feeling or sentiment, of rationality. You know, most logicians wouldn't say that rationality is a feeling or a sentiment, but William James did, and I, I understand what he means. Because we are feeling beings, right? And if we are abstracted from our feelings, then I don't think we're going to be happy. We'll be more like Mr. Spock or Mr. Tuvok or one of those other Vulcans on Star Trek. We don't seem to be happy, we don't seem to be wanting. And, and we do, right? Uh, so here's the quote from Sentiment of Rationality, one of William James's essays. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but, but to get to the gist of it, he says at the end, I am, I am sufficient as I am. Whenever you can say that to yourself, whenever you're so you know, immersed in whatever activity you're doing, whatever you're gazing at, or, or whoever you're speaking with, when you can get to that feeling, that's, that's happiness in the moment. This feeling of the sufficiency of the present moment, of its absoluteness, this absence of all need to explain it, account for it, and justify it, is what I call the sentiment. So uh, it takes practice to be present in the moment. Right? And sometimes it's maybe not prudent to be present in the moment. Uh, sometimes you've got to make plans for the morrow. But uh, I think that it's possible to try to carve out a little bit of space in every day. I mean, you can just be there. Yeah. Be present. Uh, awe. That, that the woman, that mountain climber, talking about awe. Um, in the article in the Times, they went to this guy, Dr. Kelton just written a book called Awe, A New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. Keeping that sense of wonder alive is one of the great antidotes to sadness, to anxiety. He says, awe is an emotion when you encounter things you don't understand. Wonder follows experiences of awe. And as you may have heard, philosophy begins in wonder. And so this is a good place to begin thinking about happiness. Today, half of American adults report feelings of loneliness. Um, quoting Kelter. And technology disconnects people from the, the lived physicality of their experience. Virtual realities promised an awesome future, and uh, people, but, but has not yet delivered, we would see, to judge from what people say. Uh, and people are hungry for something more, more than what technology seems likely to deliver in a way of transcendent emotions. Uh, for a sense of a, a loss of self, of the self, you, know, you don't lose the self, but the self recedes into the larger picture and you're just present with it. That's, that's, what, that's that elusive feeling, of the sufficiency of the present moment. Uh, quick again. There we go. So that word transcendent sometimes hangs people up. Uh, it's a very uh, uh, vague word, and so I like to go to uh, there you go. Proposed redefinition from the novelist Peter Ackroyd. I think he's, he's pretty close to uh, the way I think of the with his definition from his book, The Plato Papers. Um, he, he's, he's, uh, he says this. I often try to have this, this sort of transcendent experience when I'm doing ordinary mundane things like walking the dogs or going to a ball game. He breaks the word down into, into syllables and drops the sea out. Trans in dance. The ability to move beyond the end, otherwise called the dance of death. So dance of death sounds morbid, but moving beyond death, imaginatively, I think is the opposite of morbid. I think it's lightning. 
Moving beyond is something you can do here and now with a philosophical adjustment in your thinking. And you can do it daily, not just on vacation or the beach, which is the way most people think of that word holiday. It's, uh, uh, it's not just a, you know, a, an exception to your year. It's something that you can try to incorporate into your daily activity. We have, and so here's William James. <laughs> he pops up again and again in all of my presentations. We have a right ever and anon to take a moral holiday. So don't, uh, don't be confused by that terminology. Some people hear that and say, oh, moral holiday. That means I can go rob banks and do other, you know, other, other things that are unethical. No, that's not what he was talking about. The moral holiday is, as he says, let the world wag in its own way, feeling that its issues are in better hands than ours. I don't advise this as a permanent mindset. Right? Uh, but I think it's okay to carve out a few minutes or maybe an hour of your day when you take a moral holiday in that sense and say, I'm not going to think about the war of God, so I'm not going to think about Ukraine. Uh, I'm not going to permanently ignore them, but you know, for my sanity and for my happiness, I need to have a moral holiday today. <laughs> and I say that to myself every time the dogs are ready to go out for their walk. You know, that, that makes for a better dog walk. Uh, the universe, James continued, is a system of which the individual members may relax their anxieties occasionally, in which the don't care mood is also right for people. And moral holidays are in order. Right? Uh, it's, it's, it's that, when I was uh, explaining this to the uh, conference I attended last, uh, well, just last week, just the other day in, uh, in Kansas, the Baseball and Literature and Culture Conference that used to be hosted by our university and now is in Ottawa, Kansas. I was explaining this moral holidays concept and I said, it's, it's, that, it's that notion, you know, when you sing the song, take me out to the ball game and you say, I don't care if I ever get back. It's that don't care mood. Right? When you're in a don't care mood because you're doing something that is so freeing and so, uh, you know, so um, sufficient <laughs> under the moment, then you don't care. You, you don't care if you ever get back. But of course, you'll come out of that mood, and you should come out of that mood, because you've got work to do. Uh, which need not be onerous, but it's still important. But yeah, take moral holidays is another key strategic piece of advice. And don't just think that that only happens when you go to the beach, or go to the mountains, or go to wherever you go to get away from it. Try to build it into your routines. Uh, it took James a while to arrive at that profound insight. I think it's a profound insight into the mental health and happiness of our, of our country. Um, in 1870, young William James, he was up in his 20s at this point, but he was floundering. He couldn't figure out what to do with his life. Uh, and he confided to his journal that he had just about touched bottom, which you could have almost read as a suicidal cry for help. I don't know if he was sharing his journal with anybody. Uh, but then he said this. And he drew this, this drawing about that time. He had great artistic talent, and one of his uh, problems as a young man, he had talent in many directions and he couldn't commit to any of them. He couldn't decide to go be an artist. He couldn't decide to go be a naturalist uh, and explore, uh, explore the uh, South Seas. Uh, he couldn't decide what to do. But then he says, I think that yesterday was a crisis in my life, but a crisis in a good sense, that is a turning point. I finished the first part of Renouvier's second essays. Nobody ever talks about Renouvier anymore, but he was a big deal. To some people, and definitely to William James in 1870. And he read Renouvier's second essays and sees no reason why his definition of free will need be the, the definition of an illusion. And what was that definition? The sustaining of the thought because I choose to when I might have other thoughts. That's free will. James said, that's the first definition of free will I've heard that I think I've worked with. Um, take control of your inner life. Start controlling, managing your attention. And don't let Fleeting thoughts drag your attention, your consciousness away from where you need it to be in order to move ahead, to keep moving. Uh, and so he says, I'll, I'll work with that. I'll assume for the present, or at least until next year, that it's not an illusion. My first act of free will shall be to believe in free will. And this is a, the, uh, the moment from which I would date the, uh, the, the birth of the philosopher William James as opposed to just the uh, confused young man with James. Right? When he decided to make a choice and to make that choice very operational in terms of his day-to-day, -day, even hour-to-hour -hour activity. I'm going to take control of my mental life. And in that way, be free. 
Uh, here's a different, different philosopher, Bertrand Russell, a very different style of philosopher, a British philosopher who uh, was uh, more or less contemporaneous with William James, but he lived a lot longer, right? The James died in 1910, Russell died in 1970, uh, nearly 100 years old at that point. Um, they clashed a bit. Bertrand Russell was not a big fan of William James's uh, pragmatism. Uh, but here's something he said that I think James would agree with, and, and here's some common ground between them. Um, in his book, The Conquest of Happiness, Bertrand Russell said, you should make your interests gradually wider and more impersonal. Impersonal is not the word I would have chosen. I would have said maybe something like subjective. Uh, um, but, uh, but his point is, they're, they're not ego-driven. They're out there in the world, and they're, they're, they're larger than oneself, right? these impersonal um, interests. The things that you are in, like, you know, uh, the eclipse. Take an interest in the eclipse. That becomes an impersonal, you're, you're personally and subjectively interested in it, but is not in, interior to you, right? And you'll have your interior response to it. But it's out there in the world and it's much larger than you and me. He says that's something you need to do in order to conquer happiness. You think happiness is the sort of thing that needs to be conquered. Uh, so that the walls of the ego recede, your life becomes increasingly merged in the universal life. And uh, anyway, it goes on in that vein and very uh, evocatively suggests that you, your life becomes like waters flowing towards the sea. Right? And ultimately, at the end of a life, you have merged with the wider sea. Right? You know, moved away from a narrow, insular sense of, of self towards something that is universal. Um, so in one way, this is advice about how to age gracefully, but in another way, it's just advice about how to sort of step back and see yourself as part of, part of the, the universe, and, and not just you know, this lonely little specks. Uh, I think that's an important, uh, important compliment to the James E. Uh, so uh, this, this slide is a, a little bit out of place here, but just to, you'll notice the words that are in bold. When I first saw Dr. Evans' description of this series, I just picked out some words that I thought uh, I might want to hang my hat on and talk about it a little bit. And so I didn't end up talking about all of them, but I did pick three. <laughs> uh, so we'll go to the next slide to see. First of all, this uh, very provocative and uh, potentially uh, offensive statement of William James when he was writing a letter to H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells, the English novelist, the guy who wrote uh, The Invisible Man, and, uh, the time machine, various things. Um, what James said in 1906 in a letter to H.G. Wells was, the moral flabbiness born of the exclusive worship of the bitch goddess success, that with the squalid cash interpretation put on the word success, is our national disease. Woo, yeah, it's, quite, it's quite a statement. Uh, so that's just to say what it means to be successful is, is up for discussion. <laughs> And so you don't want to decide too soon. You don't want to just embrace a conventional notion of success until you've examined it and decided that that's for you. Because you might very well be chasing a conception of success that will not make you flourish. And uh, that was James's point. Too many of his countrymen were not flourishing because they had the wrong notion of what success really meant. And then Bertrand Russell had an interesting thought here. Now, Russell, I think, was kind of a rationalist. Uh, philosopher, somebody who placed a great uh, value on knowledge for its own sake. But here's what he says. Love and knowledge are both necessary, but love is, in a sense, more fundamental. Because it will lead intelligent people to seek knowledge in order to find out how to benefit those whom they love. But if people are not intelligent, they'll be content to believe what they have been told and may do harm in spite of the most genuine benevolence. So love is, is the great motivator, according to, to uh, Russell, and in that he'll agree with Aurelius. And then Emily Dickinson on hope. But, uh, hope is another of your words. Well, it's one of my favorite words. In fact, that's, that's, those were the last words in my book about William James. Uh, William James's Springs of Delight that Return to Life. Um, quoting Emily Dickinson, the, uh, the Belle of Amherst, the great poet, recluse poet, who said, hope is the thing with feathers. I love the, the, the bird theme in this presentation that recurs, and I love it. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Uh, so hope is the sort of thing that you want to keep alive no matter what's going on in your life and the world. Carry on and persevere. 
So that's the uh, cover of that book that I just mentioned. And what James says early on is uh, in his the Varieties of Religious Experience, uh, the Gifford lectures that he gave early in the 20th century that became the Varieties of Religious Experience, the published form. So the worm at the core of our usual springs of delight. So what is a spring? A spring of delight is just something that makes you happy. Right? Or maybe it's a recurrent activity, like dog walking or going to baseball games or, or whatever. Um, so our, the worm at the core of our usual springs of delight can turn us into melancholy metaphysicians. Can make us sad. Can make us unhappy. But, and that's the good news, the music can convince again and again at intervals. Right? And so our question is, how do we make that happen? The music of life can commence again and again. How? By identifying, cultivating, and enjoying our respective springs of delight. Figure out what works for you. And it won't necessarily be the same as what works for me. Right? Dog walking and baseball games may not be your thing. But you, you, you surely have a thing, or two, or a dozen. And you need to, to figure out what those are and make sure you put yourself in position to... Uh, to repeat them regularly. Uh, people, places, things, activities, habits, practices that make our lives worth living. And by turning our gaze outward, being curious and invested in something larger than ourselves. The really vital question for us all, said James, is what is this world going to be? What is life eventually to make us? I'm noticing he's not saying what is, you know, what is uh, my world or my life going to come to. It's, you know, he's attaching himself to the universal light, the way Bertrand Russell said we should. Um, so, <laughs> it's the ultimate question, right? The really vital question is the ultimate question. If, if you know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll recognize that phrase. Don't panic. Life, the universe, and everything. 42 turns out to be the meaning uh, or the answer to the question, but nobody knows what the question exactly is. And it's an odd diagram because it omits big parts of life and the universe from everything. I don't know how that works. But the point is, you want to keep the vital question before you and not let it become a, a self-referential question, a strictly self-referential question. You want to make sure that your life maintains its continuity with the larger life around you. And that includes history, and that includes the future, what the world is going to be. So, Albert Camus, uh, existentialist, French existentialist. Um, very different philosopher from William James or Bertrand Russell. But, um, like James, he posed the question, uh, is life worth living? Right. And he says, judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, kinds of questions Aristotle Manual Congress word. All of that comes afterwards. First ask, is life worth living? These are games one must answer, first answer. They liken philosophy to a game, as Wittgenstein did, right? Uh, language games and so on. Okay. Uh, Camus' Sisyphus. It'll lighten the mood here. Have it a bit easier. <laughs> there are a million Sisyphus cartoons on the internet if you ever want to amuse yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, the story of Sisyphus, the gods have have condemned Sisyphus to put it, push a stone uphill through eternity. And of course, if he ever reaches his goal, it will just roll down again and he'll have to repeat. Um, this, this came out during the pandemic, right? When we were in lockdown. Sisyphus works from home. He, he had it a bit easier. Um, but John Cagg is another philosopher, a contemporary uh, philosopher who uh, thinks it's crucial to ask that question is life worth living? And he, and he looks to William James, who wrote an essay of that same uh, time. And uh, here are some of his conclusions. Be not afraid of life. This is actually James, a, a, a quote directly from James. Be not afraid of life. Believe that life is worth living, and your belief will help create the fact. My first act, we've already seen this one, my first act of free will shall be to believe in free will. With these words, James was reborn, and his life gradually, in fits and starts, was transformed. Individuals tap meaning and experience zest. That's a word that James loved and that Bertrand Russell loved. They experience zest in singularly unique ways. I wrote, as I would put it, they have different springs of delight. In other words, we're all the same precisely because there is an irreducible difference between the zests that make our worlds meaning. So you want to figure out what yours are. And at the same time, the disappointment and tragedy of zest 
unrealized or zest extinguished is a similar feeling of utter alienation and loneliness. We feel ourselves apart uh, in the same way. So figure out what, what is zesty for you and stay close to it. John Cagg has a new, uh, I think he's calling it a podcast, maybe it's a series of session recordings, uh, called Spring Training for the Rest of Your Life. You know, I'm a baseball guy, I just got back from spring training in Arizona, but he means spring training as in perpetual preparation for getting the best out of your experience. And he focuses on not Walter Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and William James, and talks about how they all thought we were tasked with living meaningful lives, and with sorting through the jumble of our experiences and making sense of them. And this is indeed the, the great challenge of life, uh, is to realize that uh, Nobody's going to do that work for you. You have to do it. Um, if you feel unmoored or lost, then you need to look to your own experience. But you can also look to philosophy. You know, John Cagg, in, in his uh, Six Souls Healthy Mind book, says in his subtitle, William James can save your life. Might be a slight overstatement, but he can help. And, and Kieran Seti is another contemporary philosopher, sort of in the philosophical self help genre, who says philosophy can help. We're reading that book in my class. Uh, said his book's called Life is Hard, How Philosophy Can Help Us Find Our Way. He says, there must be some things that matter not because they solve a problem or address a need, uh, they, uh, but things that have existential value. Art, pure science, theoretical philosophy have value of this kind, but so do mundane activities like telling funny stories, amateur painting, swimming or sailing, carpentry or cooking, playing games. Uh, the little human things, the philosopher Zena hits has called those. The little human things. Uh, don't neglect the little human things just as you don't neglect your friends. Right? The little human things have existential value. And what those, you know, those zestful little human things are to you, uh, you know, is for you to figure out. That's, that's uh, uh, and I, as I note down here, little human things are another word for springs of delight. Things that make your life worth living. It's not just that we need them in order to recharge so that we can get back to work, but that they are the point of being alive, you know, those little human things. A future without art or science or philosophy or dog walking or baseball games <laughs> or fill in the blank for yourself would be utterly bleak since they will not survive unless we nurture them. That is our responsibility to nurture the little human things in your life, including your children. Jonathan Haidt has a new book. You may have heard about this. It's, it's made quite a stir and had a, a big a pre rollout to uh, fanfare. Adolescent mental health, he says in his new book, The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. Adolescent mental health began to decline across Europe in the early 2010s. With girls in Western European teens hit the hardest. Underlying these regional changes is a story about how adolescents from wealthy, individualistic, and secular nations were less tightly bound into strong communities and therefore more vulnerable to the harms of the new phone-based childhood that emerged in the early 20s. He gave a TED talk about that if you want to look for it, check it out. That, that's the, the, the core thesis that he's going so Something changed, and the main thing that changed was everybody started carrying around these devices that enabled them to monitor you know, how other people are living and maybe you know, by, by invidious comparison deciding that your life isn't made you right. So I always quote Eleanor Roosevelt, that students who tell me they're anxious or worried that people are judging them. You know who Eleanor Roosevelt was? First lady, uh, FDR's wife. Uh, she said, you wouldn't worry so much about what other people think of you if you realized how self they do. <laughs> I really think that's true, and I think that, that, that lifts a big burden off your shoulders if you can internalize that, that insight. People aren't judging you all the time. And, and I, it, it just occurred to me, and I remember when my girls started, started saying that, so I, I, I just thought it was a mean thing. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. They really meant it, I guess. I guess that, that generation, your generation, was worried about being judged, or at least a number of you were. And Eleanor would say, don't worry. In order to feel social anxiety, says uh, Donald Robertson, who's got a new book about Stoicism, specifically Marcus Aurelius, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Marcus Aurelius was the emperor, and he was a Stoic. And you may know there was a famous Stoic, uh, a, a, 
a Roman Stoic who was also contemporaneous, more or less, with Marcus, and he was a slave. And they were both Stoics, so that's interesting. The, the Stoicism as a philosophy you know, has such a wide appeal, very different uh, kinds of people. Um, Stoicism being, in a nutshell, the view that uh, you should not be perturbed about things that are beyond your control, as most things are. But he, he says, in order to feel social anxiety, you have to believe that other people's negative opinions of you are worth getting upset about. That it's really bad if they dislike you and really important to win their approval. Even people who suffer from severe social anxiety, though, social phobia, all the way, tend to feel normal when speaking to children or to their close friends about trivial matters, with a few exceptions. Nevertheless, they feel highly anxious when talking to people they think are very important about subjects they think are very important. If your fundamental worldview, by contrast, assumes that your status in the eyes of others is of negligible importance, then it follows that you should be beyond the reach of social anxiety. Thank you. So, what about Gen Z angst that we've heard so much about? Well, Mark Twain said there's nothing sadder than a young pessimist, except an old optimist. I say I'm neither, I'm ameliorist. Ameliorist says things are neither as bad as they can be, nor, uh, nor are they uh, perfect. Uh, I'm just looking for ways to make a small contribution to make it a little better. Ameliorism, right? From the word to ameliorate, to make that. But I, I'm not sure that Twain said, except an old optimist, that's not more my addition. But I do know that late in his life, Twain was very bitter. Uh, he actually published a, a book late called the, the Damned Human Race. And he got very cynical in his later years. Uh, and so therefore would have had very little sympathy for optimists of any age. Uh, but members of Gen Z, ages 12 to 27, are significantly, according to some studies, significantly less likely to rate their current and future lives high, uh, highly than millennials were when they were the same. Among those 1826, just 15% said that their mental health was excellent. That is a large decline from both 2013, which falls into John Height's range of concern. And 2003, when just over half said so. So this is quite a sea change, and I think it, it, it ought to give us pause and ought to give us you know, a reason to consider Jonathan Height's proposals. You know, his strategy suggests that we need to take phones out of the hands of very young children. Um, and uh, I don't know how we're going to pull that off. You might be right. My cartoon's really fuzzy here. That must not be a very high change. I don't probably have to read the, uh, relay the uh, caption to you. But this is a, a dog therapist <laughs> with his uh, human client. And he's saying, have you tried taking long walks? Well, that's my question <laughs> to anybody who's never tried taking long walks. If you're feeling bad, even a short walk, you know, Get up and go around the block or something. Go down the street, around the house, around the backyard. Uh, it's amazing that both the, uh, the body chemistry um, and just the shift of perspective that can come from a little bit of motion, um, you know, contrary to Zeno, can make a huge difference in your perspective. And I know this may not be the optimal therapy for those who suffer serious neurochemical imbalances or whose state of health is not more than the mobility we dog walkers enjoy. But these are my dogs, uh, Nell and Peta. Nell is a boxer pit, um, <laughs> and uh, Peta is a dachshund left. Imagine what you can see. And there we are going down the street, uh, which we do every morning and every evening. And, uh, and I figure. Uh, I get just a, a little moral holiday boost in the morning that I need to carry me through most of my day, and then when it gets to wear off, I walk the dogs again, and I get that boost, carries me to bed. Uh, days go better. Oh, I skipped my, my center section. Uh, I do think it would work for a great many who haven't tried it. I learned that my own total health has been up a great from our habit of daily dog. Days go better, life goes better when you stick with the routines that keep your feet on the ground, as it were. All ten of them in our case. Again, maybe walking isn't your thing, but something, something that gets you sort of out of your head and into the wider world, even if it's just the world of your neighborhood, I think can contribute to a positive shift in your outlook. One thing I've learned from you into our dog walking routine and from baseball, another quote from Lydia James, his essay, The Rules of Belief, that's him with his daughter. Our errors 
are surely not such awfully solemn things in a world where we're so certain to encourage in spite of all our caution, we're going to make mistakes. I'm not perfect. A certain lightness of heart seems healthier than this excessive nervousness on, on their behalf. At any rate, it seems the fittest thing for the empiricist philosopher, which he was and which I try to be. Uh, so parapetech, uh, let's, uh, let me just gloss over this and then see whether there's time to come back to it at any great length. But I just want to take note that throughout the history of Western philosophy, well, philosophy in general, um, many, many, many philosophers have attested to the value of walking as a tribute to them. So, just the names that are mentioned here uh, from that gymnasium to the mind essay. Uh, Erasmus, Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, Henry David Thoreau, Soren Kierkegaard, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and I think we've got a few more coming up. Darwin planted a, a, a walking path on his estate that he called uh, his sandwalk. And, and just an acre and a half, and he'd go around and around and around while he was trying to figure out theory of natural selection. Um, and then uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, his friend reported that every morning Bertie would go for an hour's walk by himself. He'd come back, he'd write fluently, he wouldn't have to make any revisions. And then that would get published. Of course, he was Bertrand Russell. Still, I, I found my own uh, writing goes more fluently after a walk, and I try to build that into my schedule whenever I can. And uh, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, who uh, said that, uh, said that the, the only good thoughts were those that came from the walk. Well, he has some bad thoughts that came from the walk. So well. <laughs> That's another name you can associate with the peripatetic movement in the modern time. Here's another uh, report on, on current times. Uh, parents are highly involved in their adult children's lives. Maybe you all can, can testify to this or, or contradict it in your own way. Um, and, uh, and are fine with their involvement, but maybe that's part of the problem. Young people say their mental health is suffering, and recent data shows they're much more likely to say this than those before them, as we said. Some researchers have sounded alarms that one driver of this is children's lack of independence, and that overparenting can deprive children of developing skills to handle the person. That's a thought. Maybe we need to direct them towards the, the older folks. A recent Atlantic Monthly article says we've stopped hanging out, spending more time alone staring at screens. A dysfunctional form of self-isolation goes far beyond healthy solitude. From 2003 to 22, American men reduced their average hours of face-to-face -face socializing by about 30%. For unmarried Americans, the decline was even bigger, more than 35%. For teenagers, it was more than 45%. We're a social species, as we've known at least since Aristotle. Our mental health depends on regular interactions with real people in the real spaces. Boys and girls aged 15 to 19 reduced their weekly social hangouts by more than three hours a week. There's no statistical record of any other period in U.S. history of people have spent more time on their own. There's a graph, and you can see it. You know, it's nose diving. Anything else here? No? There we go. Solitude, anxiety, and dissatisfaction seem to be rising in locked step. Teenage depression and hopelessness are setting new records over the year. The share of young people who say they have a, have a close friend has plummeted. This, uh, this author says, I don't think hanging out more will solve every problem, but I do think social, every social crisis in the U.S. could be helped somewhat. People spend a little more time with other people and a little less time gazing into digital content that's designed to make us anxious and despondent about the world. We try. Now, I know there are some na uh, natures, uh, more like Henry Thoreau's, but most of us aren't Henry. Henry said, he finds it wholesome to be alone the greater part of the time. To be in company is wearisome. I, mean, I understand what he's saying. I, I feel that way sometimes myself, but not all the time. It's not healthy to squirrel yourself away. We're, we're, most of us not in there. Um, if I know anything at all about mental health and flourishing, it's that sitting around and brooding is not healthy. Because I was once an undergraduate who sat around and brooding. Um, the, the Jamesian shrink, not to be confused with the Socratic shrink, the Socratic shrink was a guy named Lou Marinoff, and he wrote this book years ago called Plato, not Prozac. Plato would not be my medicine. I'm, I'm more an Aristotle. Kind of uh, but I wrote this thing under the title The Jamesian Shrink. We teachers these days can't avoid noticing how many of our young students are self-diagnosing as anxious. You have to make a talk or we make a presentation. The first thing they want to say is, I have anxiety, so don't judge me. <laughs> uh, 
So the diagnosing is anxious, displaced from a consistent core identity, pessimistic about their prospects in life. I say young adulthood, if I can remember that far back, <laughs> has always been a challenging time in life, but things do seem different now. Uh, it's become commonplace to identify the internet and social media as the locus of difference driving young aunts. I guess that'll do in the absence of more directly life-threatening sources of distress like, say, a Russian invasion or war of extermination. <coughs> there we go. Uh, but, anyway, that, that, uh, that particular piece goes on to conclude that, uh, that uh, before we self-diagnose and uh, conclude that uh, Afflicted, we just need to try a few other strategic interventions. Uh, this is that thing that came out a few weeks ago about, about uh, surveying uh, people's uh, sense of uh, mental well-being. And so that's one thing one can do is to monitor one's own states of mind, be aware of them. So do something about it. That's one thing to start with. Okay. Uh, I likely am getting close to time here. Um, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, I would like to just say that, uh, you know, as I said, I was once, uh, once a, an angsty undergraduate, um, and I didn't have any social media at all <laughs> back in the 70s. Um, um, and it was about my junior year of college at the University of Missouri when I found a milestone, hit, hit a milestone, found a turning point. Uh, and discovered the health and happiness sustaining benefits of the peripatetic life. I don't exactly remember what got me out there. Why did I go on my first long walk? Uh, there must have been a dog involved. Um, but I, I do know that it coincided with this, the time when I changed my major to philosophy. So some things converged there. Uh, and it's also a time when I discovered uh, what Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson called the cosmic perspective. Uh, you could call it the cosmopolitan perspective, or, or what Bertrand Russell called the universal life perspective, right? Seeing your life is flowing into that, the universe of other people. Um, I think all of that reinforces, you know, is, is mutually reinforcing. Right? The cosmic perspective, Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is within us, we are made of star stuff, we are away from the universe to know itself. That was a powerful statement uh, that I had not considered before until about my junior year. And coincided with the time when I started studying philosophy and, and, and moving. <laughs> and all of that, I think, made a real difference in the quality of my experience. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, the cosmic perspective not only embraces our genetic kinship with all life on Earth, but also val values our chemical kinship with any yet to be discovered life in the universe. If we find E.T. out there, we should call him brother or sister or whatever we should call him. Um, and then there's our atomic kinship with the universe itself. This goes back to Democritus and the ancient atomists who you know, first formulated the atomic hypothesis that everything is composed of little tiny stuff. Right? Everything has that in common with everything else. That's part of the cosmic perspective. And it should get you out of your own head. Would you agree? I find the cosmic perspective aligns nicely with the ancient stoic wisdom of an old dead emperor. I've already heard this. I'll say it again. I think it bears repeating every day. When you arise in the morning, think of what a pre precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love. And dwell on the beauty of life, watch the stars, and see yourself running with it. So there's another cosmic perspective. And then William James said this. Remember, he said this in a letter. Now this was in a, before he had his, his crisis that I alluded to earlier. Um, he was only like 26, I think, when he wrote this letter to his friend. His friend was having a... a having a, an episode of what we would call depression. James wrote in his letter, a very pressing letter for a 26-year-old, Remember, when old December's darkness is everywhere about you, that the world is really, in every minutest point, as full of life as in the most joyous morning you ever lived. The sun is wanging down, and the waves are dancing, and the gulls are skimming down at the mouth of the Amazon. He says, as freshly as in the first morning of creation, and the hour is just as fit as any hour that ever was for a new gospel of cheer to be preached. I am sure that one can, by merely thinking of these matters of fact, limit the power of one's evil moods over one's way of looking at the gospel. 1868, uh, well before he formulated this, this notion, uh, this notion of uh, the pragmatic method in philosophy and so on and so forth, uh, he was already 
you know, he was already thinking about that shift of thought, a shift of perspective that enables you to get over a bad mood or depressive state of mind. <coughs> so, my last words. Uh, well, there it is. I've got words so many things. He was writing to another friend. This is later in his life. Um, his friend, uh, named Ferdinand Schiller. Um, a British philosopher with a German name, but uh, Schiller um, had, had had a serious health challenge, and James wrote this to him. He said, keep your health, your splendid health, and of course health encompasses mental as well as physical health. It is better than all the truths under the firm. And uh, I just want to echo that point. I think it's right. Thank you very much. <laughs>